Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 14 of the Short Explanations podcast. My name is Hyam. It's just Tom today, and he's in the center. He's Hello. right in the middle. He's right in the center there. It's just us. It's We have some news, and Tom's going to wow us with some sort of randomness that it's just on him. We're going to see how far we get today. Maybe the news will take up 30 minutes, and then we can save this for next week and get you like a double episode. Uh, so I think we should just jump right into it and let's start th- th- these order. Th- uh, these stories are in no random order. The first thing is before we get into the story, I just want to say that if you have an IOT device, internet of things, and I don't know if we covered internet of things like proper, anything you buy or anything on your network should be automatically updated. Like that should be the bare minimum of anything IOT. If it's, If it's not auto-updated, you should think about replacing it. With that said, HP, the printer company, I guess, I guess they're just just a printer company at this point, they updated updated their printer firmware automatically, and they didn't do any beta testing, which is not the greatest thing ever. So they updated it because it was auto-update, and people call them like, hey, I can't print now, and they're like, what? Turns out they didn't know. That's a problem. <laughs> so, I mean, with that said, we we still, still, still recommend that any device you buy, especially from a company like HP, should be auto-updated, okay? I mean, unless you're going to manually do it, which we don't recommend, and you should at least have them on separate networks. But HP, I mean, they're a reputable company. It's They're not... Ameri- they're Amer- they are American company. They they have lots to lose by making these oopses. And like this is a problem. I I there at this point there was like no solution when as we were reporting this of last from last week. That's that's kind of a problem. Um I I would like to to take the opportunity to uh plug it and I'm I'm gonna add this to our show notes because I, I didn't. Um the Verge has put out just a fantastic, wonderful review uh, of their their best printer 2023 list, uh, which is uh, just buy this brother laser printer everyone has. You know, the brother, whatever it is, will print stuff and it, it's fine. It's fine. And honestly, that's kind of what I did four years ago is I just found the brother laser thing, whatever. The model numbers don't matter. Just buy buy the brother laser jet thing on Amazon or wherever, and it's fine. Um, So HP's business model has turned from, you know, doing cool technology stuff into how can we extract liquid gold from this ink and ruin your life by charging you $75,000 per ink refill. And that's, that's ridiculous. Um, The, the brother laser jet thing, you, you buy it once. I've never had to replace the toner, but it lasts forever just do that it's a boring choice it's fine it'll work fine well by hp yeah so i i was telling tom i go to costco costco has an awesome return policy i buy a printer i don't print anything i mean i think like tom does just some ups return labels every once in a while the ink dries out it clogs the tubes it doesn't i can't fix it I return it a year and a half back to Costco and I tell them like, I'm sorry, but I mean, this is genuine ink. Like I didn't do anything wrong. And they're like, no problem. They give me $150 back and I just buy the next model. I got bored of that. Like I said, I can't be doing this because I'll need it and I won't have it. So I bought a color laser. HP had this color laser for three, almost like $300. The receipt's still on the bottom. I can still return it, but it's been working in the middle in the middle of printing like i'm talking between pages not between job but between pages i got a supply error and i go to you go you go search it you have non-genuine hp ink and if you didn't know hp has been caught doing this they've been issuing updates just to literally change the chip to see if it's genuine and then they shut it down and and people and like this is like really dastardly we're telling you if you have an iot device keep it on auto updated and here you get some nonsense where a company is doing something anti-competitive to do this to you and 
they're just ripping off everybody. It is really bad. You know how back in the day, Microsoft pushed out some really heinous updates. Like, and it used to be a, I know it's still a problem, but it used to be a way bigger problem. But they pushed some pretty terrible updates and absolutely blew up a bunch of computers. And then people like, ah, whatever, man, I'm just turning off auto update and I'm never updating again. The computer works fine today. If I turn off auto update, it'll continue working fine. And then we had a big spat of malware and people's computers getting hijacked left and right because weren't running updates because Microsoft pushed a bad one and hurt somebody once. Yeah, that's what HP is doing here. So, and, you know, unfortunately, these printers aren't just, like, USB-connected devices anymore. They they have uh, full networking stacks. They are literal tiny computers with a print head in them, uh, right? Like, these, these are full-featured internet-connected devices, and, and you connect something to the internet, and especially when it's got, you know, the power of a small Raspberry Pi computer, um, or a little less, I, you know, keeping those things up to date and secure is super important. Poisoning the update well like this, either through bad patches or anti-consumer, anti-competitive patches, just hurts everyone. So HP, get it together, man. What happened to you? I mean, again, it's people hate printers it's there's a reason why in office space the person beats up the printer why people hate i mean i don't know anyone who says my life's goal is to work on printers it's like that doesn't happen it's can we not have printers and it's because companies like hp and not brother but i can't lexmark i remember lexmark at some point lexmark was pretty bad canon or oh, epson you have shack peddling peddling like uh big tanks of whatever it is and it's like just to get more ink like and then oh and then remember when they use now they sell with trial packs of ink so you have to buy more like this is bad like somebody should just come up and say we're gonna make the greatest printer and if you charge people money they'll pay for it because it just works so so anyway it's it's printers are bad um I've read the I've read this article that you've posted. Brother is always there. The only problem it is black and white and it doesn't scan. It's probably just the whatever. So if that meets your needs, that's great. Like a hundred, I think it's like a hundred dollars, hundred and ten dollars. That's the one you buy. Just go buy it because my dad has brother and it just seems to work. Like the software is a little wonky, but it works. Hey, if you just oh. need a really, really boring straightforward document printer not a scanner not an all-in-one not a hybrid thing not a prints glow in the dark ink and your pages explode if the wrong person's reading them like that not none of that crazy stuff if you just want a really boring black and white printer the brother laser whatever thing it's fine it works just do that so now i'm gonna i'm gonna pop quiz tom on tlds so top level domains okay what was .ly, like in bit.ly? Do you remember? Oh, man. What was .ly? I, mm, I honestly don't know. And I, I, it hurts me because, like, that's the most American thing is being ignorant of the rest of the world. And I don't know what nation owns .ly. For Libya. It was Libya. A country. Okay. A country that we are not allowed to do business with. Anyway, anyway, uh, I can just rushed or not rushed, but they put together a whole bunch of like really awesome, cool TLDs, like dot prof, like you can be, and a whole bunch of other things. But like you could be dot professor, like that's kind of cool. Like dot dad dot dad, so you could have your dad jokes in a single store, but. And the copywriter didn't really fully think this through. They created the .zip TLD. And while we understand why this is a thing, like, that's kind of cool. Like you could, you can do you .zip for different applications. They actually said that .zip should stand for zippy. It should be a, a fast website. That was their actual thing. I, I don't know the last time I said, I want the slow version of this website. But anyway, they, they did dot .zip. The problem is, and all of that, and we have an article there, is that dot .zip is a file extension that that is usually safe, 
but can contain malware if done wrong. And we usually tell people don't download dot zips from random sites unless you know what you're doing. Yeah, this this is just a bad idea, but I I, I hate to say it this way. It it was inevitable. As soon as we started adding, and I'm I'm gonna get all super, you know, like old man yelling at cloud, Luditeville, what have you. Uh, join our signal group and tell me how wrong and old and crusty I am. Um, but, you know, this was bound to happen as we added more and more and more TLDs, right? Because we don't have, like, 17 file extensions, right? It's an unlimited number of file extensions, and they can be any number of characters. Three is classic, but, you know, you can have three as you want. Um, and with TLDs, you know, we, we had a small handful and it, it grew and grew and we had location specific ones and then everybody ran to the gold mine of, oh, let's put everything on a, on a new TLD. A dot zip just seems kind of short sighted, right? It's an extremely popular file extension, uh, and, uh, hopefully it doesn't become an extremely popular top-level domain, but that said, I don't know if we can really put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, like, they could try to cancel it and shut down everybody's domains, but I don't know if that's realistic or if they're going to do that. Um, in mean, any case, it's a security nightmare. I was going to say, like, dot, I found the, the link, dot ESQ for Esquire, dot prof, or dot PhD. Like if you're doing if you're doing something and you're in academics, that sounds great. Techies.nexus.foo.move, dot move like dads dot dad like those sound okay. Like we get it, they're lighthearted. But when you do like we said the the file extension domain, that that gets a that gets hairy because is it legit and how is the browser going to handle it? Like that's the other thing. Like, is the browser going to handle it like something to download or they're going to check the the header first? Or as I'm hearing, you could just block entire TLDs. So somebody suggested that we just block ahead of time. If everyone blocks right now the .zip TLD, people are not going to do it because most browsers block it. But we got to do it now. That's what I heard. I, I mean, so sure. Let's say that we all gang together and everyone that understands security stuff or even has tech friends and told all their friends and family to just go to your router and, and click the special like block zip button and it's it's not going to be that simple right a it's not going to be that simple b even if every single super nerdy tech nerd on the planet or even just a regular nerdy tech nerds on the planet group together and unionize against the dot zip tld i still don't think we make up more than i'm going to be super generous here five percent of the population hashtag nobody cares um i just i i would love for that to be like a collective action that we could actually you know uh, put forward and, and make happen and and stop the this craziness but i just don't think we have enough people to make that work. um it'd be yeah. nice and honestly it might be it might be fine for your own personal protection if you don't want to get caught up and accidentally click on a, on a malicious uh you know zip tld uh link but uh, I don't think it solves the problem. It might protect you personally, um, at least until there's something that uses .zip that's a totally legitimate domain name that a whole bunch of things you know connect to because it's the internet and everybody connects to everybody for everything. Um, I'm specifically thinking of like JavaScript resources on CDN. Um, but like you know, if somebody hosts a CDN of JavaScript resources and it becomes like you know the the next wave of content delivery for whatever particular popular library that exists that day uh you know blocking that could actually break websites so yeah uh, you could block it until it breaks something and then you know selectively unblock and that's fine it's a little bit of work but that's probably a solution i'm gonna ignore it and try not to click on anything that ends in zip unless i'm really expecting a zip file but that's the lazy option. It's I, I, I guess, I guess the problem is that people still think of .com, .net and .org. And most people try the .com first. I'm, I'm a little more advanced and I'm like, is it a .org? Is it a .net? Like, I don't know what it is. 
Um, so I'm not rushing to hit .com. And if it's one of those other ones, people start throwing a red flag or they just don't remember it. And I guess there's some cool ones like .io, like you, you, you start remembering it for different things, but nobody's remembering why they're using it. They're clicking on a link, they're scanning a QR code, but it's one of those things. Can we, there is no reason to do this now. Sure. Uh, somebody's gonna say, well, why not? I, I think this is a great idea. There's always that one person, but. I don't know. I, I feel like this is this is going to be bad. I urge you to read the article there because I mean, there's a there's a thing which is the right GitHub thing that takes you to the URL versus the download, and you can see. And I think I got it right, but that's only because I know the GitHub URL style. Like that that was the that was the thing. Otherwise, I would have no idea. And then we have to add it to the things that we tell people to look for while fishing. Is there a lock? But now the lock doesn't matter. Is there a green bar? But the green bar doesn't matter. Um, do you know the sender? But if you do know the sender, you have to check if they're really sending it to you. And now it's just one more thing that people don't want to do. So anyway, I, I, I think we're done with that. But Yeah, my... Like, I, I don't... It's not a conspiracy theory anything like that deep but i i could see this being used as extra ammunition because google wanted to get rid of url fragments in the in the top line right they they didn't want you to go to google.com slash a bunch of gibberish right they they wanted you to go to google.com and it shows google.com up there and if you click in the address bar you can edit the url fragments to get where you wanted to go if if you wanted to um but it it does pose uh, kind of an interesting safety benefit if you do remove everything from that URL. If this thing just said v1271.zip, that I personally don't like that. I like more information up there, um, but it does make it easier for people to see where they're at and uh, if they're on the site they expect to be. So. I was pretty firmly in the camp of no, don't strip your all fragments from the address bar. Um, you know, it's simplification that doesn't need to be there. And now I'm looking at the dot zip TLD. I'm like, well, maybe they had a point. Uh, there's there's definitely some facets to this issue, and I I might be changing my mind on uh, removing your all fragments from the address bar. So. Oh. Let's move on. We'll get more. Obviously, more will come out and we'll go from there. But the next piece is that Net Netflix is going, for better or worse, doing their once every 30 day check in on home. So if you don't know, Netflix is now after telling us to share your password and now telling us that you are a criminal and you're going to go to jail and the RIA and everybody's going to go after you if you don't live at your house all the time and Netflixing and chilling while on the is not really a thing. You're sharing it with your family members who live across, across the country or at different houses or whatever else. If you are not in your home, you are stuck. And so, and, but they're not giving us details. The problem is, is that I don't know about you. I don't know if there's any too much to watch with Netflix anymore. Like, I don't remember the last time I, I really watched Netflix. Like, I don't know when the last time I watched TV. Let's let's go with that. Like I haven't I basically just watch YouTube right now. Like that that's really it. Like I I know you watch more than I do, but that's about it. I don't watch really anything else. I'm kind of in the same boat with you. I honestly I'm, most of my viewing has just been YouTube. Either like, you know, makers and people 3D printing stuff or video game people or reviews or you know, what have you. But yeah, I Honestly, when when I get that uh, that angry message from Netflix when I'm trying to you know log in remotely when I'm on vacation or something, I'm just gonna cancel the account. I don't really use it that much anyway. It's um, it's I have Ted Lasso left. I'm waiting for that. I have Maze Marvelous Miss Maisel left. I'm waiting for that to finish, which I think it just did. Like if I hear a show, I think it's one of those things that we're just going to wait till the summer when there's nothing new on TV and do a month of each service. And that's it. Like, I, I don't know. I think Netflix shot themselves in the foot. They should, I, I don't know. But anyway, if you didn't know once every 30 days, the primary login has to choose a location, your house, whatever it is. And anyone you, 
anywhere else, you have to log in once every 30 days from that location. And this hasn't happened in the United States yet, but apparently it's rolling out really soon. So somebody suggested, we'll just use TailScale. So the idea was you have TailScale on these devices and your remote, you turn on TailScale and then you can either tether the TV to your phone just to log in, like do whatever you need for like five minutes. And then you're back to the old Wi-Fi. Or you you do the check-in and you watch through Netflix, whatever. The the problem is, and Tom's going to explain this a little more, is that you're just opening everyone else up to your home network because they're using TailScale. Like you have to give the people you give the password to access to your home network, which you probably you probably don't want to do. If it's your family members and you know that they're fine, that's a different story. But let's give the internet a few weeks, and I'm sure they'll find a better solution. Yeah, and it's it's definitely more of a workaround. It's not like calling it a solution, especially like a permanent solution, is not the case. Um, so yeah, like you said, giving people access to your home network kind of feels a little weird. Now, you can in TailScale share certain machines. I don't know if you can share them as exit nodes, though, because that's, that's going to be the key, right? You have to go through a machine on that, like the Netflix household, right? And then route out to the yeah. internet through that. You can pretty easily do that on TailScale full access with outsiders and shared machines i don't know um this might be a case where tail skill really isn't the solution but like something like a wireguard based vpn on a raspberry pi sitting in your house that you can selectively dole out access to and just just have it go out the internet and not touch any of your other devices in your house that might be a cleaner solution um I, you know one of the downsides about this is that if Netflix does this, they're probably not going to do it and then just kind of sit back, right? If they're going forward with this, they're going to come out swinging. So as soon as people start using VPNs and, you know, weaponizing that against Netflix, uh, they could just say, okay, well, that's fine. You need to make an accurate geolocation call from your device that you are trying to connect. To. So like smart TVs, it's probably not going to happen because most, at least to my knowledge, don't have onboard GPS hardware. But your cell phone certainly does. Your tablet absolutely does. So, you know, could could Netflix just make it really, really hard to share passwords and you know require that fine grained location control? Yeah, they could, and they could absolutely up the ante. Uh, now, my official recommendation on that is if Netflix gets to be too onerous, and if if you just don't like the smell of this on the surface. Cancel the account. Vote with your dollars. Walk away. Uh, the Last of Us is fantastic. Uh, that's that's on uh, HBO. You know, pay pay for a month. Watch the thing you want to watch. Cancel, and you know, hopefully, save yourself some cash that way. We got we got to the point where with all the streaming services, it's just it's. Just, I will tell you that in December we have to make a decision about cable. And cable and internet is not much more than just internet, like $80 for just internet, but then you got to do everything else. My, my cable bill with Fios with gigabit and everything is like 150. I mean, you stop DVR service, but 150, you can't do YouTube TV for 150. You can't do anything. Eighty dollars plus seventy for YouTube TV. There you go, one fifty. Like you might as well just stay with what you have. Cable is coming back, and yes, there may not be anything on it, but I think, like you said, you wait till the summer, you binge, and you wait till January, and you just binge the shows that you want to watch, and then you just cancel it. That's it. Go on it with a couple people and just move on. Anyway, I don't. There, there's going to be more. Let's continue. None of us are legal experts, but apparently Section 230 is still good. Um, that was a Supreme Court case that was just decided on. Section 230, really quickly, and again, not lawyers. We, are, we don't even play lawyers on TV, is that um, it's, it's, it's a censorship statute that if you run a public server, you are not responsible for what goes on there because you're not moderating. It's for the good of the public. So... Um, be, 
people are saying that oh twitter housed uh isis and terrorism and child pornography and all this and twitter and google and all of them said hey section 230 we're not able to police this and people were afraid because if they did police it then there'd be no more public comment they would the end of any sort of commenting system would go away because no one has the funds to do it well the supreme court said unanimously that section 230 is still good and there's an article there, and there's not too much more than that, but it's a Section 230 is not good, but for right now, it's the best we had have. Yeah, so this is, you know, with if you run a public service on the internet, you cannot be sued for content that your users post on your service. If you, and I, I think there's some, some wiggle room here, if you have reasonable moderators, Right. So if you take things down that are against your terms of service or against the law in, you know, a reasonable uh, amount of time, um, then cool. You you would fall under the Section 230 protection. Now, that doesn't mean you can just open up a, a web server to allow people to post whatever. And then they post full episodes of like The Simpsons or something on your web host and you're sharing it with the world. Like if you leave that up for too long. Yeah. the Fox Corporation is absolutely going to sue you for that. Um, but uh, it does mean you can run something like Facebook, and if somebody, you know, threatens a public official or something, an act of violence, um, you are not going to be arrested as the owners of Facebook, right, for something some crazy person posts. Uh, instead, you're going to tell your mod team, hey, go ahead and ban them and then turn over the, the evidence to the state, um, and you're fine. Um, 230 was controversial because some people don't didn't like what other people were posting on certain tech companies, uh, notably Twitter before it was bought. Um, and uh, they these people wanted a legal way to be able to shut down or remove that content from the Internet. So the fact that 230 is still alive and well, at least for now, is a good thing. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Um, but is it I, I would say on average, a good thing for the internet? Yeah. Yeah, I would. Uh, without Section 230, without that style of legal protection, uh, social media sites just couldn't really exist, not without a whole lot of legal risk. What we find out when we go back through these laws is that the laws that we're using to protect whatever we feel is holy in the world was never written well. It never protected everything. It protects this little one thing that we use for for whatever it is. Section 230 is not is not an internet censorship bill. It just protects people from the ills of like public moderation. It's not written well. It's not a good law, but getting rid of it without a replacement is also really bad. And so so while nobody is cheering for 230 to stay, it's that there's no better law. And until there is, um, we need something there to protect people, pr protect uh, content creators from doing something, from bad things happening. Yeah. I mean, that's it. Um, I There's would love to have more. a legal expert on the show to go over 2.30 in detail. We should figure that out. We can make that happen. The problem is legal expert. One thing <laughs> I know about lawyers is that everything depends. And we're not asking. <laughs> sure. and, and with we're not asking for this to be case law or to be entered into evidence. It's your honor. The, the, the podcast, the short explanations said that this is now fact. No, we want someone to project with us type thing and, and go from there. But again, it's one of those things that it's a bad law, but for right now it's the house of cards. that's keeping it together because if section two thirty went away, I mean, Twitter may still be there because apparently Elon Musk does whatever he wants. But Facebook would most likely go away. And before you're like, yeah, I want Facebook to go away. Everything would go, all moderation and anything would go away. Reddit would go away, everything else. So maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. YouTube comments would go away. Again, another good thing. But last last article for the night, um, KeyPass, that's KeyPass vulnerability. They were able to extract the master password. And before you go all doom and gloom, it's not as bad as you think. Um, it just essentially, they found a way to get the master password, but you need physical access. 
and we've talked about that before. If somebody has physical access to your computer, um, they can do All just about. All bets are off. Yeah, we, we can't do it. So before you read the headlines, key pass, the number one secure, right? They were the secure ones. They were the compile from source ones. Uh, no, I mean, they, they did offer binary downloads. You could compile from source. But yeah, KeePass is an open source project and it runs on just about anything out there. It's honestly great. I love KeePass. It's one of the ugliest programs you will ever use in your entire life. But for a password manager that you want to keep stuff safe, yeah, works just fine. That was supposed to be the gold standard if you wanted the security. And yeah. they had no cloud. No cloud, like you- no backups, yeah. no nothing. And it's a file existing on your device. You are fully responsible for it. So if your hard drive blows up with your key pass database on it, you don't have a backup. You're out of luck. Sorry. But hey, really secure. So and the problem and and people said after last pass getting hacked, we'll, we'll go to we're gonna go to key pass. The problem I had with key pass is they didn't offer like a separate a standalone program. They offered a framework. So it's like key pass XC was the one, and I was like no, you have to offer, if you're going to do this, you have to offer your own thing. I can't tell the people in my life, like key pass is a framework, find something that uses key pass. That's setting people up for failure. It's so we always said, use something other than, than key pass because it's, it really is just too ugly, but the diehards that wanted full control over, that's where they went to, which is fine. That's, I mean, they probably had a command line. Like you could do your passwords from the command line, but don't go crazy that there's this uh, physical attack vector that they can get your master password because if somebody has your computer, they can just do about they can do literally anything. Let me let me walk you through this. This this is coming from uh, NIST.gov. If you would like to to check it out, uh, NVD.NIST.gov. Um, that's the uh, National Vulnerability Database. It's it's cool. It's fantastic. Any CVE or re- like publicly reported security issue, gonna live right here, and it's I love it. I love it. Um, so it is possible to uh, pull the master password uh, with the exception of the first character, but, you know, that's run through all the characters. That's easy enough. Um, you can pull the master password with the exception of the first character through a memory dump of the key pass process. So you have to have admin access, obviously. Um, the swap file, hibernation file, or full RAM dump of the entire system. Now, all of those things are going to require some hardcore admin access and physical access, unless for some reason you're sharing your hyperfile.sys on a file share. And if you are, please contact me. I would like to get to know your level of crazy. Um, but yeah, I don't freak out. Just update KeePass. There's a new version out there that uses a different API that, that's more hardened to this style of attack. Um, but, you know... The old adage always applies. If somebody has physical access to your machine, all bets are off. It cannot be. And again, if your threat model is one where this is what you're worried about, I mean. First, upgrade to a better security podcast because you are out of our league. It's, it's, I mean, we keep on saying that. We're trying to protect the normal person and... And I'm still happy with Bitwarden. If you're not on Bitwarden or 1Password, I mean, KeePass is just not... If you're just the average person and you just want things to work, Bitwarden is for you. And if something bad happens, it's going to take you some time to deal with it. But you know what? You're going to save yourself increments of time for years and years and years before everything before bad things happen. Um, I... I I looked at KeePass. It's just, it's, I, I can't, I can't recommend it to anybody because it's just too difficult to use. But again, if you're, if you're in that, um, what's it called? If you're in that threat model where this is important to you, yeah, don't listen to us or listen to us and then listen to somebody else or tell us why we're wrong. That is always an option if you join our signal group. So, uh, you know, get in contact with us. Our, our stuff's all over the website. You can just ask us. And, uh, like, you know, it's a private group, but it's not, like, private, private. It's not secret. And we're giving this away for free. Most other people will be like, pay membership to get in. We're just giving it for free to you. So, I mean, because we enjoy what we do. So, and we're a bunch of, we don't know who's in there, but everyone seems to be really happy. So, 
it's a breath of fresh air anyway i don't have anything else we were going to do some random generators but i think we covered a whole bunch of news and a lighthearted episode and i think just we'll save this for next week and we will continue from there with that said i think i'm i'm going to call it a night and say goodbye or good indeed night. in the future totp we're going over those six digit codes and i'm going to try to teach you how they work without getting too crazy technical so with that said let's say good night and we will see you hopefully next week see y'all bye everybody